everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Microbiology Round presentation on One Health in Action. My name is Melissa Richard Greenblatt. I am a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. So before we get started, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. To enhance the presentation experience, participant audio and video has been disabled. The chat pod has been deactivated to limit any distraction during the presentation. Please also use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session, and a discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. And I would also like to state that as the moderator of this session, I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Francesco Olea Popelka. Dr. Francesco Olea Popelka is an associate professor in the Barrel Ivy Endowed Chair in One Health in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University in London, Ontario. During his career as a veterinary epidemiologist, Dr. Olea Popelka has applied epidemiological tools, skills, and a collaborative One Health approach to address challenges at the interface of livestock, wildlife, and humans in different environments around the world. Dr. Oleo Popelka, thank you very much for joining us for our PHO Microbiology Rounds today. I will now hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa, for your introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you are located. Before I start, I would like to thank Public Health Ontario for inviting me to deliver this talk, and also to my colleague, Dr. Ana Cabrera in my own institution for suggesting me as a speaker. Also, I, my disclaimer is that I don't have any conflict of interest. And also I would like to express that my opinions are exactly that, my opinions, and therefore they not necessarily represent official policies of view of Public Health Ontario, nor of any of the multiple institutions, collaborations, or colleagues that I will mention during this presentation that I have the fortune to collaborate with. And rather, I would like to thank all my collaborators, uh, colleagues and institutions around the world, and certainly my own institution, the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Chulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University, London, Ontario. So at the end of this presentation, uh, uh, it will be great if all the audience will be uh, able to define and describe what is One Health, uh, the key concepts of One Health, and understand both the interdependence between uh, uh, people, other animal species, and the environment health, and why the One Health approach is important to address these challenges at the interface of animals, uh, uh, other animals, people, and the environment. So how I'm going to do that? Briefly, is start with some theory and definitions of what is One Health, but then focus the entire presentation on examples that I have been uh, using, uh, real-world examples of how we have used the One Health approach to end up with a couple of slides to conclusions and reflections, uh, uh, responses. So let's see what the One Health Commission, and in this website that I provide here, you can find several definitions of One Health, but this is was the, uh, let's say an initial definition many years ago. One Health is a collaborative effort of multiple health science professions. And do, you can keep reading that, that work locally to attain optimal health for domestic animal wildlife species. But notice that that definition now is not anymore a, 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 a valid. In the new definition or newer, the multiple health professions was removed which I think for several reasons I will discuss here is a very good, is a very good uh, 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 move. And then recently in December, 2021, uh, uh, the, new, the new One Health High Level uh, uh, Committee that was uh, formed uh, came up with this definition. Again, I'm not going to read the definition, but I'm going to point out key things, right? Health of humans, people, the environment are interconnected, all right? Recognize the inter interdependence of this. And very importantly, the approach, which certainly One Health is an approach, recognize that multiple sectors, 
multiple sectors are important when addressing health issues, okay? So that's very, very, very important, multiple sectors. And that's the reason why only health professions were removed. So let's move directly to examples of how I'm being myself with several collaborators uh, using the World Health Approach for some specific uh, uh, health issues. Let's talk, for example, about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis in humans is caused by a bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, all right? TB, also known as tuberculosis, can affect anyone around the world, but certainly this is a disease of poverty, of communities of people that are vulnerable in economic distress or marginalized, okay? So it's really a disease of poverty, despite the fact that technically anyone can get uh, infected or, 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 or sick. It is estimated, the official estimate by the World Health Organization, WHO, is that approximately one quarter of the world population, that means approximately 2 billion, with a B, billion, are infected with Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causal agent of TB. However, as we should remember basic principles of epidemiology and infectious diseases, infection does not it means being sick. Let's remember that being exposed, being infected, being infectious, being affected or ill or testing positive, those are all different things and it should not be used as a synonymous. In the case of tuberculosis, only five to 15% of people actually, of these infected people that are called latent infection, latent TB, only five to 15% of them progress to clinical disease or being sick with tuberculosis. And that's very important to remember. So who are more likely or who are at higher risk to progress to disease, to being sick from TB? Well, again, people in marginalized communities are also people with compromised immune system. And certainly HIV AIDS is one an, an important comorbidity of risk factor, but we don't need to we don't need to forget that malnutrition, poor nutrition is some of is one is a, a main immunosuppressor in the world. Other important comorbidities are diabetes or, for example, the use of tobacco. All those people with those conditions eh, have a, a higher risk of falling ill with tuberculosis. So every year the WHO published their official report, and in the last year report was estimated that eh, eh, these are incidents of new cases, approximately 10 million new cases of tuberculosis in the year 2020, and from this, approximately 1.5 million people die. And what is very important to remember and not forget is that also tuberculosis affect children, which is a little bit neglected in the area of tuberculosis. But yes, indeed, tuberculosis can also affect and a, a, a cause suffering, clinical suffering among children. And we will get back to that subsequently. Of course, we cannot ignore that in the last two years, the response to COVID-19 have a, a, a reversed decades of progress on tuberculosis. And again, the WHO reported last year that for the first time in decades, TB deaths increase and access to healthcare related tuberculosis also decrease. So you can see how eh, 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 everything is indeed truly related and diseases don't happen on isolation. So going back to mycobacterium tuberculosis, we need to also understand that mycobacterium Bacterium tuberculosis is not alone there in the environment. Mycobacterium tuberculosis belong to the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex in which there are other species of Mycobacterium that I list here and what right now I will focus on Mycobacterium bovis. Mycobacterium bovis, you may know, or maybe you may not know that uh, the VCG vaccine that actually, as a matter of fact, I have because I was born in South America and it's one of the most widely used vaccines in children around the world until today, uh, uh, is actually Mycobacterium bovis. So uh, 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 Calmet angerin, which gave the name to the vaccine, Bacillus Calmet angerin, actually is Mycobacterium bovis attenuated, which is injected in children to prevent mostly meningitis, tuberculosis, but actually it's used to, to, to vaccinate against tuberculosis, okay? So that's very important how we start seeing connections between a, a animal bacteria, uh, and animal hosts and humans. Because Mycobacterium bovis is the causal agent of bovine tuberculosis, all right? 
eh, and some of the characteristics of Mycobacterium bovis, the, the uh, microbiological characteristics are very important, as we will see later on when it comes to culturing or identifying these uh, 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 as it relates to methods used for standard tuberculosis caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it's very important to understand that although genetically speaking, they are very similar bacteria, their differences are important enough for the epidemiology and the clinical outcomes of this disease. So how is a, 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 a bovine tuber or Mycobacterium bovis transmitted among uh, animals? Well, not very different than humans. The main way of transmission is airborne, uh, but also there are other, other uh, uh, ways such as uh, 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 ingestion via milk products or all, also some congenital or sexually transmitted uh, less frequent cases. This is how animals look uh, in advanced stages of this disease, which uh, gives the name of consumption because the disease, which is chronic in, in, in a long period of time will end up making you look like this bones and skin, as we like to say in the veterinary world. The pathology is quite characteristic, tuberculosis, granulomas, uh, lesions that can be found uh, uh, either in the parenchyma of the lungs, but also extrapulmonarily, especially on lymph nodes, depending on the, uh, on the immune response to the, to the invader, okay? The main reservoir of, of Mycobacterium bovis is certainly cattle, however, Mycobacterium bovis have the ability to infect and cause disease most warm uh, 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 animals, including humans, all right? Including humans. Here we have just some examples of a, 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 a species with Mycobacterium bovis. This is a black, rhin or black rhinoceros in 2016 in South Africa, in which my colleagues in Kruger National Park conducted all the laboratory work. And as you can see, typical lesions of tuberculosis here on the lungs, and it was confirmed Mycobacterium bovis. But here is a very interesting a, a, a case also in Kruger National Park. And here I give all the credit to my colleague, Dr. Michelle Miller and Dr. Peter Bass. Uh, that uh, uh, this elephant was reported by a tourist, as you can see, typical consumption, a, a extremely poor body condition. And when the necropsy was conducted, you can see the typical granulomas lesions. But very interestingly, after the laboratory and molecular work was conducted, this was mycobacterium tuberculosis confirmed, published. And this is one clear example of what is called as reverse zoonosis a human adapted pathogen such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which uh, uh, cause disease, and in this case, very surely the death of this elephant, free ranging elephant in uh, South Africa. And as you can see how my colleagues here, of course, talk about one health when discussing this particular case. And like this, with Dr. Michelle Miller in the year 2013, we published this paper here that uh, uh, describe less known a scenarios in which transmission of mycobacteria species occurs across multiple species and different species and not the standard a, a, a human to human or cow to cow. Here we, 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 we focus on interspecies transmission. And that's the reason why current work that we are conducting in Africa in Zimbabwe, when we look at tuberculosis, we look at in a holistic manner, comprehensive manner. We look at mycobacterium tuberculosis in humans. We look at mycobacterium bovis in cows. And we also look at some new uh, species of Mycobacterium uh, uh, in wildlife species, all right? And why we do this? Because certainly in these scenarios, there is a very close interaction between different species. As you can see in this picture, we have elephants, humans, warthogs, and then just across the fence, you have mongoose and you have lions and you have everything else. So it's important to have a comprehensive approach uh, to look at the bigger picture and the interconnections across different species. And as such, we have published purpose and our scientific work in workshops, in elephants, and in lions and other species. But the focus of today's presentation, eh, 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 I want to focus a little bit on the work that we have done with zoonotic tuberculosis caused by Mycobacterium bovis in humans. All right? And why is that? Because a eh, long time ago, eh, 2013, this disease was officially reported, zoonotic tuberculosis due to M. bovis in humans, as a neglected zoonosis in, in the official documentation by the WHO. And why was that? 
this is this was nothing new and in this paper published by colleagues uh, from universities and the cdc is because uh, the the human medicine arena the clinicians the physicians the tb doctors say well uh, only one percent or 1.4 percent of people actually are infected with tb with, with bovine tb or with sonotic tb right so then then uh, uh, I've been working on tuberculosis since before uh, 19, uh, 1988. So then I realized there was something extremely wrong with this uh, conclusion. Only 1.4% of people are affected with embovis. And the reason why I was really worried about this is because this uh, uh, data, this figure, this estimate came from studies done in the United States at the national level, which at that time was the only country actively looking for embovis in humans. So then I understand why the figure was available, but then as an epidemiologist, I realized that it's a very, very bad idea to take a figure, an estimate, an odd ratio from a particular scenario and extrapolate it to the rest of the world. And I start talking with colleagues and I start uh, uh, working with the colleagues that actually created these figures, in particular, Dr. Tim Rodwell from California, San Diego area, and found his papers that actually confirmed what I was saying. Even this 1.4% was not representative of the picture within the United States, in which, for example, in California, in the San Diego area, from children with tuberculosis, 45% of the children with TB in San Diego area were embobies. And then, of course, not surprisingly, when you start looking at literature from other parts of the world that, as you can see here, looks quite different than San Diego, and human-animal interaction in a specific environment is quite different than a a, a, a big city, of course, not surprisingly, you find very different figures than the 1.5% that everyone thought. And unfortunately, some people still think this is the case. And then when you keep doing your literature review, you keep finding that when you look at high risk groups of people, right? And you look for mycobacterium bobbies, and then you look with the right tools, not surprisingly, you find, you find studies that report a, a, a risk or percentage of people with M. bovis significantly higher than 1.4%, all right? So then who, what type of humans are more likely to get mycobacterium bovis? Well, the main, the main, the primary way of uh, transmission of M. bovis from other animals to humans is via consumption of uh, food products contaminated with mycobacterium bovis, mostly milk, but also can be fresh cheeses or raw or products that are not uh, heated or pasteurized. But also, also we don't we don't need, we, we we need to remember that mycobacterium bovis also can be transmitted uh, 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 via per, uh, between people via the air route. Okay, and of course the most vulnerable communities for zoonotic tuberculosis are those ones that live in areas where the disease is highly prevalent in livestock, where milk is not pasteurized, where there are immunosuppressors, uh, factors such as HIV, AIDS, or malnutrition, and it happens to be that these are the people living in the most neglected, rural, marginalized communities around the world. It is very important also to remember that the standard treatment recommended by the WHO and the Stop TB Partnership for Tuberculosis is comprised of four drugs, rifampicin, isoniazid, piracinamide, and etambutol. But guess what? Mycobacterium bovis, and of course that treatment is for human tuberculosis, but mycobacterium bovis is naturally resistant to piracinamide. It's one of the key differences with M tuberculosis. So as you can imagine, people that are misdiagnosed as human TB having uh, bovine TB or sonotic TB uh, are starting two months of treatment, west, wasting money, west, wasting drugs that is going to do nothing to mycobacterium bodies. So, but the million dollar question really it is, all right, so from all the humans that suffered TB, let's say from the 10 million that the WHO reported last year, how many actually have mycobacterium bovis. That actually was an answer, that, a question that was asked to me in the year 2000 when I was uh, defending my thesis to become a veterinarian. And the answer was very clear. I don't know. And then they asked me that question in 2010 again, but Francisco, how many people? I say, I don't know. And in 2015, they asked me again, and I say, I don't know. And then in 2019, as I will show you soon, the answer changed, and we will get to that very soon. So what happened in 2010 when they asked me this question? 
He was a physician, Dr. Paula Fujiwara from the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the most important NGO working for over a hundred years on, in tuberculosis. So I joined the scientific committee for the International Union. And here is a picture of me, the only veterinarian interacted with nurses, public health officials, physicians, veterinarians, et cetera, from different institutions working on tuberculosis. The important thing about the union I want to mention as an NGO, and me as a professor working with an NGO for the first time is that the union, they, they follow their procedures and their, their vision and mission in three, principle, in three principles, knowing, sharing, and acting, which I love because you need to have the scientific knowledge, you need to share it properly with communication experts, and you need to act in the field where it matters, okay? So at the union, I realized that Dr. Tim Rodwell, that colleague from San Diego that I was learning, that was thinking the same way I was thinking, I found him one day at the union. You can see Dr. Tim Rodwell here at the middle. And with Dr. Alejandro Pereira from Mexico, Adrian Mugonga from Uganda, we created a working group. I say we need to create a working group because the first problem here is lack of awareness of the magnitudes of this problem. So we created this group and as a professor in a university with my MPH student, Angela here, we start creating these uh, flyers, you know, and the typical poster presentations about these key aspects of sonotic tuberculosis that I already described to you. Extra pulmonary, different epidemiology, a, 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 a natural antimicrobial resistant, poor people, marginalized people, one health, et cetera. And then of course, as a professor, the work that professors and scientists do, we start here with Dr. Paula Fujiwara, the physician that I mentioned, start writing papers in very influential journals, you know, clinical infectious diseases, targeting physicians, and again, mentioning very clear why sonotic tuberculosis and people suffering infected and affected clinically by Mycobacterium bovis should be looked and treated differently than standard tuberculosis. And then of course, we. You know, that's what professors do. We, we write more papers and, uh, 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 and then we wrote this very influential paper here. This is, was only published in 2016 and has become by far the most influential cited paper in my career, uh, not only because we, we, we call for action with very uh, uh, specific and concrete actions, but also because of the authors in these papers. I will not go one by one, but these are very <clears throat> influential, renowned people in the tuberculosis uh, uh, arena around the world. And uh, that not necessarily always work together, but for this particular issue, they all came together with joined forces and we published this paper that as I say now in the area of sonotic tuberculosis has become a paper to go. And then of course, uh, 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 when One Health became more uh, uh, familiar to different uh, audiences around the world, I was invited to write uh, one chapter in the Essential Tuberculosis book, which is the book uh, for, for uh, medical students around the world, you know, on tuberculosis. And also I, I was one of the editors and wrote a few chapters in the Bovine Tuberculosis book, of course, collaborating with other colleagues. So as you can see, the typical work that professors do, you know, write your papers, do the science and communicate it, which is extremely important. But uh, for me, that was not enough with my own mentality, okay? So a key moment came when, again, working with Dr. Paula Fujiwara at the union, she told me, Francisco, we need more than a book. We need more than a paper. And I say, what's that? If we really wanna make a change on sonotic tuberculosis and start looking after these people, we need to talk with, with, with professional communicators, journalists in this point. And I must say that, that, uh, that uh, it's, not, it's not an area that I'm an expert. And actually I've been always afraid of journalists in my life or previous experiences, you know? But when I met these two gentlemen, I realized that of course, when you work with excellent, I mean, outstanding journalists and communicators, it's actually brilliant, okay? And in, in this case, these are people that work with presidents of countries, you know, and take care of the communications of very important institutions. So. After I start working with Joe, uh, with Joe and with Michael, the rest of history, the topic of sonotic tuberculosis was all over the media around the world. The topic of sonotic tuberculosis went in the most known influential media sources around the world, press conference with the director of the tuberculosis program at the WHO in Geneva here, Dr. Mario Rabliglione, you know, and this uh, 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 receive an unprecedented level of coverage 
again, in media sources and international conference, both of human tuberculosis and veterinary medicine, mycobacterium bovis tuberculosis. And then, of course, uh, uh, with social media, we, we work with social media, despite the fact I'm really afraid of social media for obvious reasons. But I went there, I crossed that line, I crossed that bridge, and we gave conference and talks in different platforms in social media, which was very important. And of course, with all these this exposure or this campaign of awareness, uh, 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 not surprisingly, I, I ended up in London, like I like to call the other London in England, uh, talking with members of parliament. He and Nick Herbert, I visit him and I have my 10 minutes of glory talking with him about the importance of zoonotic tuberculosis because Nick is one of his priorities is tuberculosis around the world. So again, as you can see, already start learning as a professor of veterinarian, start interacting with highly influential politicians or decision makers. And all this work then led to the Stop TB Partnership, one of the most important organizations around the world for tuberculosis, to have a consultation to create the new, the new plan to end TB in 2016. And, for the, and we have an online consultation about zoonotic tuberculosis. And this resulted that for the first time ever, people affected by zoonotic TB, for the first time ever in the history of tuberculosis, was put in this plan to end TB in chapter three as reaching key populations, as you can see here, the outcome of that. We didn't stop there and we created uh, in-person consultations in Geneva, in the headquarters of the uh, WHO, with all these wonderful collaborating institutions that you can see here and all these wonderful people here and colleagues. And we brought the topic of zoonotic tuberculosis to the uh, WHO Strategic Technical and Advisory Group on June 2016. And this resulted in WHO and the STAC uh, group approving uh, zoonotic tuberculosis as a new priority for WHO. Soon I will show you the outcome of that. Also, we went to other uh, level of politicians, to the United Nations, and in 2018, we brought the topic of zoonotic tuberculosis and One Health, and we got a political declaration from all the leaders from all the countries around the world that uh, people and communities at risk of uh, bovine tuberculosis need to be, need to be, need to be not neglected anymore. And here, and since 2019, you can see how the, the WHO in that official report that they publish every, every year, again, for the first time, publish a page. It's okay, a page to start with something with estimates, estimates of the burden, incidents, new cases of zoonotic tuberculosis around the world. And as you can see globally, they estimated 147,000 new cases a year with a extremely large uncertainty interval for obvious reasons, both for morbidity and mortality. And the re which is great to have an estimate, to have it acknowledged, to have it officially on a document of such a reputable institution like the WHO is great. But why, and this is the estimate I was mentioned before, 147,000. But I think, and there is a consensus that this is an a, a underestimate. And why is that? It's very simple, and people in microbiology will understand that immediately. First of all, from an epidemiological point of view, because only today there are four or five countries that are actively looking for Mycobacterium bovis as a causal agent of tuberculosis in humans. The rest of the world are not looking. And when this pathogen is being looked, it's being looked with the wrong methods, laboratory methods, because another key difference between Mycobacterium bovis and tuberculosis is that Mycobacterium bovis requires pyruvate to grow in culture, and it doesn't grow well with glycerol in the standard Lowenstein Jensen culture media. And none of the routinely used technique to diagnose TB in humans, none of them, not even the most uh, new one, gene expert, none of them can differentiate between M. bovis and M. tuberculosis. So that's why all this work from universities and professors and specific studies become very important, all right? So after we got this at the WHO, uh, 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 officially recognizing this the WHO, uh, we went uh, uh, further and we got a mandate to write a zoonotic tuberculosis roadmap uh, after that uh, event at the WHO. So we did, and here is when we brought together this NGO, the union with the World Health Organization, 
and I keep the old logo of the World Organization for Animal Health, now WUHA, but in those days called OIE, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, uh, we work all together in a very cohesive and organized manner, and we came out with this roadmap that now is available uh, 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 in three languages, English, French, and Spanish, and uh, you, can, you can access freely this document uh, in, the, in the link that is provided here that you will have in the slides in a few weeks. But again, we didn't stop there because as we say, all this fantastic work that has been done and ideas that we have, uh, uh, somebody needs to pay for it. So we approached the people, uh, uh, actually people from the Global Fund approaches us. And, and we have several conversations, you know, uh, uh, to support the work uh, or specifically the German constituency to include One Health specifically to fight HTV and malaria. And the great news is that in the budget from the Global Fund for the year 2023, so next year, uh, One Health has a specific item in the Global Fund right now. And those are great news. Also, because I start learning about the importance of social media, I created the Sonotic TV network. Again, uh, uh, already available for a couple of years. And this is a network that I created after I joined Western University with one of my students there. That is, a, a mission is to connect stakeholders working towards addressing challenges posed by Sonotic TV. And by stakeholder, that's a very key word in One Health, as I explained in my two slides of the definition of One Health not just physicians and veterinarians. Most importantly for me are uh, uh, people affected by TB, the community. Those are the, those are the people that join here and we will get to that very soon, but also communicators, politicians, scientists, NGOs, government officials, everyone can join and has joined this network. This is a very interesting uh, 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 and wonderful One Health uh, 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 initiative that we we started with a uh, here Dr. Uh, uh, Ted Miller from from the University uh, of North Texas Health Science Center. He's an economist, uh, and with Dr. Pagan from the University of New York, who is a social worker anthropologist, and we work together with me as the veterinarian in a One Health project for tuberculosis. You know, in Central America. And, and my arm of this project was Uganda. We submitted this project uh, to the CDC in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. Uh, of course, March 18, 2020. As you know what happened on March 13, 2020. So we submitted this project. And in, in September, 2020, uh, we got a letter from the CDC congratulating us because we succeeded uh, in getting our project approved. But this was the first time in my career that I get a lot of congratulations. Your grant has been approved, but at this time we cannot allocate the funds to this project. That was on September, 2020. And they told us we will wait 12 months to see if we can allocate the funds to these projects. And unfortunately uh, uh, they didn't. But still this show you how an economist, an anthropologist and a veterinarian, we did work together and actually succeed in getting approved. And now we are waiting for a key time to resubmit our project again, to work in the field, to better detect and treat zoonotic tuberculosis in these rural areas in Central America and in Uganda. And as I say, for me as a, as a veterinarian and as a person that like working in the field, it's very important to work with the affected communities, not just write paper, books, or work eh, 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 with the big institutions, which is very important, but also it's important to work in the field with the local stakeholders. And here is one of the most important I have met in my life. Tim Pijan Leseni, she's a Sonotic TV survivor and she's an advocate. She's an ambassador. She became a global ambassador of tuberculosis and Sonotic tuberculosis because she belongs to the Maasai community and she's the founder and CEO of a community-based organization, Talaku. And her life is dedicated to educate her people, the Maasai community, to prevent and better treat uh, sonotic tuberculosis and TB. With uh, Tim Pijan Leseni, we have a couple of projects. And again, in working in Kenya, we work with, uh, with the national, local, uh, and county and city uh, health authorities. And that has been great because not only they have approved, understand our One Health approach, uh, but they have fully supported and endorsed our support. 
our projects, excuse me. And then uh, being at Western University has been great because I have met great colleagues, again, not veterinarian, not physician, but in this case, Dr. Nube, an anthropologist in the School of Health Sciences. And with Dr. Nube, we have been able to get a couple of projects funded. And one of them was to understand the, the, the experiences of community health volunteers. Again, these are people in the field, often people with, with very uh, 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 difficult life conditions, but they volunteer in the community. And they are, as I like to say, an army of people that deliver medicine, collect samples, and make sure that people are taking their medicine. They are extremely important, but they volunteer. So we, we conducted a study with them. It's published two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, what this published, published. You can have access. It's freely available on the internet to really understand that social component of tuberculosis in these rural communities. And when we have all these people that play a very important role in, in health access and health delivery to those people suffering from tuberculosis. Again, working with uh, Tim Pijan Leseni and with one of my first master's students at Western University, we conduct another study in which we look at the capacities now of the facilities, these rural health facilities. Of, you might understand in rural Kenya, these are not your standard hospital in Canada or in the United States. These are rural health facilities. And we want to understand what is available there. What do people know? What type of uh, uh, people uh, uh, seek for care in these facilities? So we went there and, and, and conducted this study. We are writing the results, but it's very important that with the support that we have, we got high response rates for these studies. All right. And to change a little bit disease, but we keep with exactly the same One Health approach, which is the, the topic of my presentation today, the emphasis. With another of my students, we use the same approach now for rabies. Now we are changing to a viral disease and we are using the One Health approach in Zimbabwe because rabies, as you can see, affect thousands of people in the world. Rabies is a, almost 100%, certainly 100% a, a fatal disease. There are one or two cases that is being reported to survive, but basically it's 100% fatal disease. And a large proportion of people dying every year from rabies are children. And again, we repeat the same story in marginalized communities. All right. So rabies represent an excellent example for a One Health approach. And that's what we did with now a Master of Science, Ryan LaPena, my students, collaborating from a university with a, a with a non-governmental organizations a, a, and other institutions in Pretoria a, a, that we construct this collaborative project for rabies. Again, we are writing the results, but again, very important, having that local engagement, working with the community and me as a professor just providing support, but let them to run the show in the communities, especially in Africa, I think is the right approach and not surprisingly in this one with 500 samples, we got 100% participatory rate. All right, and to start wrapping up, this one, this work that I led with rabies, and we go back to working with Dr. Paula Fujiwara, led me to work with the Asia Pacific City Alliance, APCAT, which they have done tremendous amount of work with tobacco when it comes to engaging majors, politicians, decision makers for this region, 78 cities in 12 countries, and we brought the One Health approach, the veterinary component to this group of politicians to talk about rabies in this part of the world. And now we are starting a project to vaccinate 200,000 dogs in Bali, Indonesia. And this is a mega project that uh, we start working a year ago, December 2021. And in the, this year, December 2022, we have several activities. One of the major ones is that we we are part of the pre preliminary workshops for the G20 that just happened in Bali, Indonesia, two weeks ago. So, so as you can see here, working with politicians is very important. We got uh, the topic of One Health not only in Bali for rabies, but also we got it and contributed to One Health being again this year, a very important topic in the G20 meetings that just happened in Bali, Indonesia. Okay, and this again, all this work will be published very soon in, a, in this journal. All right, so I would like to, with those topics of tuberculosis, which I, most of my time is dedicated to that disease, and lately I've been working more in rabies, I want to let you know that the same approach have been used again with colleagues at Western University, 
uh, in this case, Dr. Bemich at the school, uh, the Ivy School of Business, and we wrote and published a teaching note and case study related to COVID-19 and mink with the situation that happened in Denmark with the massive killing of 17 or 18 million mink in response to COVID. And basically in this one, we discussed uh, uh, how the nuclear option that the Danish government used was a, a, a no, not the right approach. And actually uh, we call it the nuclear option because here we provide all the epidemiological, medical, uh, animal management, available science that was ignored at the time that the Danish government decided to kill all the mink, ignoring all the available science. So all that is published. And the same, the One Health approach has been used uh, with other colleagues in different departments, in this case with Dr. Lugin in the Department of Geog Geography and the Environment uh, for uh, projects and initiatives related to climate change and, and food systems. Uh, Dr. Lugin as the leader has been able to succeed getting some uh, significant funding. And also with Dr. Uh, Saverio Stranger from the Department of Epidemiology, we have been able to work in some initiatives for the One Health for our students at Western University. Very importantly, with Dr. Anna Gans, who is a, a physician, a pediatrician in the uh, ICU unit at Victoria Hospital in London. She's the director of the Medical uh, 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 Children Environmental Health Center in Ontario. And Dr. Gans, uh, we are collaborating on aspects related to uh, uh, environmental health, climate change, and uh, of course, human health. And with Dr. Frisbee and with Dr. McKinley, we are also using the One Health approach when it comes to indigenous health and non-infectious diseases. Before I finish, I want to also mention that we have had an outstanding collaboration with the University of Wales, the Ontario Veterinary College, and the One Health Institute. And on a yearly basis, we conduct uh, several activities uh, related to One Health. One of them last year was a panel that we organized with the Canadian Science Policy Conference, in which we also talk about the importance of the One Health approach in the Canadian context. And this is the same approach that we are using for our academic programs at Western University, in which again, social determinants of health are very important when we look at the intersection between human, animal, and environmental health. A few, a few take home message. I think that uh, uh, rather than breaking silos, and some people like to think about One Health is coming here to break silos. No, 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 One Health is not destructive. On the contrary, One Health really focuses on integrating disciplines, scientists, sectors, you know, of society, and very much value the work of each specific discipline and actually is in need of it. But the focus of One Health is to integrate in them to have a more robust approach, if you want. And as you can see from my uh, uh, talk and my approach to health, uh, I personally think, this is my statement, that uh, while having the engagement and approval and endorsements of all the big institutions is, is crucial, uh, uh, is not sufficient. You need to work with local solutions. I mean, for local solutions, uh, working with the local stakeholders because they know their local problems better. And to finish up, of course, as the One Health Chair and a person that very much value One Health, I think personally that collaboration across sectors and disciplines uh, is critically needed, especially in today's world. And I want to quote myself on something that I say in India in 2019 in the TV conference there and stick with me forever, and you can see it now on the bottom of my email, is that science and medical knowledge are 100% necessary to improve health, 100% necessary, but not sufficient. And that is what I think that the collaboration and the multisectoral approach of One Health is extremely necessary. With that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Dr. Olea Popelka for sharing your experiences in One Health and all, and thank you also for all the work that you have done both locally and internationally. Um, it, it's really exciting to hear um, something a, a little bit different outside of kind of our everyday uh, clinical, but very much um, a partnership and in, interrelated to the things that we do. And I can say that especially um, from a per mycobacteriologist perspective. So now we'll move on to our Q&A pod to address some of the questions that we have. And for uh, those of you who have not uh, put in your questions yet, please do so. Um, so 
I will start with a couple of uh, transmission and clinical presentation questions. So the, the first question that is in our chat box is, can human and bovis be transmitted among other humans? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you very much for the question. And yes, 100% yes. Uh, uh, that's something that was thought not to be possible, you know? Uh, I would say 20 years ago when I started studying this, but in the last 10 years, there are concrete, concrete data, excellent publications that have demonstrated that. Human to human transmission of mycobacterium bovis via the air uh, pathway, and all this work is, uh, as I say, is being done with a robust uh, scientific techniques, and it has been proved. It's not, it's not the most common one, certainly, but it's, uh, it's possible. Thank you. And then uh, just to follow up on that, it so from animal to human transmission, so we, we, you were talking about pasteurization and drinking of unpasteurized milk and, and consuming unpasteurized cheeses and other dairy products. Are there other uh, predominant modes of transmission? Yes, well, those are, those are, and all, all depends on the environment. So let me give you a couple of examples. The studies, some of the most robust studies they come from California and the CDC, and they have the means and the techniques. And uh, thankfully, in the United States, the, the incidence is, is low compared to other countries of tuberculosis in general. So they can look at those few cases of M. bovis. Uh, in that case, there is a very important sociocultural factor, and that is where you come from. And if you are from Latin America, and specifically from Mexico in California, there is a high tradition of consumption of fresh cheeses, queso fresco. Right? It's delicious, done without pasteurization, and it's one of the things that gets smuggled uh, across the border, you know. And then, of course, because mycobacterium bovis also is prevalent in cows in Mexico, then you have a perfect scenario when humans can get it from over there. In Africa, in some of the countries that I work, consumption of raw milk or unpasteurized milk is uh, 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 represent 80% of the milk consumed. So that's another form. But then also the, then you have the sour, sour creams or sour cheeses, you know, and certainly milk products are the most predominant. Then when it comes to meat, meat itself, meat, the, 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 I mean, the beef, the meat, it does not represent a major risk. However, there are, for example, in Nigeria, there is a practice that's called fuku elegusi in which a parts of the animals with lesions, with these tuberculous lesions, are sold, are not only sold like anything, sold as a delicacy, something more expensive because they are crunchy and they have creamy, you know, and people eat them, believe it or not, of course, in very rural areas. So we have colleagues, Dr. Simeon Kadmon in the University of Ibadan, he's dealing with that particular situation. And then if you move to India, in India, data, very solid data is starting to emerge that actually a, a, a cows are infected and affected, clinically sick, as creating mycobacterium tuberculosis in milk. Which again, in veterinary medicine, we learned, yes, indeed, mycobacterium tuberculosis can infect cows, bovines, but it's not really a pathogen that will cause clinical disease. Well. In India, for obvious social, cultural, religions, cultural, economy, how, how, how cows and humans interact, is a very different scenario. So you see, it all depends. And then we have some cases in which also humans can get embobies from an animal, excreting it respiratorily, uh, if they, of course, are high-risk humans. Uh, people working in slaughterhouses, farmers, or veterinarians that have close contact with the air uh, from the animal, also can get embodies that way. Do you feel that the current IPAC measures um, that we have in our slaughter facilities in Canada are sufficient for protection against embobis? Yes, the, 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 the food safety measures in Canada and the United States, I don't, I don't know exactly the ones they have today, but for my time that I have spent in Canada uh, are, are among, are among of the, um, the more robust ones, if you can, you know, like um, uh, high income countries, Canada, United States, Europe, they're very standard food safety and meat inspection. That's what I wanted to say, meat inspection procedures to, to catch up uh, 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 tuberculous lesions. And I, 
I don't wanna no, I don't wanna say if 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 a meat inspection play a role. I don't remember if meat inspection play a role in the last few outbreaks that happened in Canada. Um, in the last, well, I know there have been a few in the last 20 years since I've been in Canada. Can you speak to some of those outbreaks? Uh, for many of those are, are probably not aware who are on this on, on this um, presentation. General, well, I, I kind of speak general. I, I don't have all the details, uh, but uh, generally an outbreak is considered, Canada is considered, I mean, if you talk about the, the bovine tuberculosis uh, community in Canada, uh, cattle, cows are considered to be free of bovine TB, but you need to be careful when you say free, because free doesn't mean complete absence. There are some spots and hot spots on which Mycobacterium bovis is circulating or has been known to be circulating in in uh, in Canada. And elk, and elk in Manitoba, and bison in Alberta has been some of the species that are well known to to. To, to host, to harbor Mycobacterium bovis. And then here and there, then there are outbreaks or a, a, a epidemics, they are called outbreaks in which a herd of cows, domestic animals uh, are declared infected and confirmed having bovine tuberculosis. And I don't remember exactly the years, but I remember in uh, Peterborough in the early 2000s, there was one, and I think that the last ones in the last 10 years or five years maybe was in Alberta. And what happened is that the veterinarians either be a meat inspection or, or testing the animals, say here there is tuberculosis and then those herds are restricted, quarantined, and, and there is a process to start testing the neighboring herds to make sure that if the disease is spread, is contained as soon as possible. But I don't remember, I mean, bovine tuberculosis is such a, a, a low prevalence in Canada that I don't have it in the top of my head. When was the last outbreak? As yeah, and similar to some of the cases that we that we see in at least, I mean, I, we probably don't capture everything in our testing here, but um, we have very few cases because when we see pyrazidamide resistance, we'll always go in and determine what the species is from that complex through our mm -hmm. laboratory testing. And, and through using that algorithm, we have seen very few uh, cases of uh, Mycobacterium bovis subspecies bovis and, and not the BCG. We certainly see uh, more of the BCG. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that, you mean in, and that you mean in humans? In humans, yes. Yeah, no, human, uh, sonotic tuberculosis, uh, Mycobacterium bovis in humans in Canada is certainly not in the radar. It's not a, it's not a major concern right now. It's, I mean, and I have talked to some colleagues in uh, Queen's University that are working on this, you know, um, yeah, that's what I understand. And, and that is that is the norm in high income countries because most of the milk and the food products are, 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 are subject to good or very good food safety practices. But then again, you have those communities or those particular scenarios in which still mycobacterium bovis can find its way to a human host. Um, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions uh, regarding the approach that you use for One Health that I think would be really interesting to have uh, your feedback on. So have you encountered pushback regarding the use of One Health approach to tackle problems such as zoonotic TB or rabies? Everyone always seems so enthusiastic about One Health, but I'm wondering if you have encountered hesitation, particularly behind the scenes. Absolutely. And always. Yes. Not a doubt. I don't know how to answer that question. Of course, of course, of course, you find resistance and at different levels. And we don't need to mention names here. Uh, and it, it's because it's a, well, One Health really is not a new way of thinking. But when, when you think about First Nation communities, they, they get it, you know, and uh, ancient communities also understood the connection between uh, humans, other animals, and the environment, and they respect it and they value that. So now One Health comes and whether in the medical community, in the veterinary community, in the academic community, always you find pushback. And, and I think that you always will keep finding the pushback. And I keep finding it. And it doesn't matter what I do, there were people that will say, whatever. I will not repeat the words that will say. But then what I do, how I approach that is like, I try to explain, I try to integrate them, I certainly invite them, I show them how, they could contribute 
uh, uh, respecting the egos, because especially in academia, let's be honest, you need to understand that they are they're very protective of this is my discipline and this is, let's say, this is epidemiology or this is microbiology and, and this is veterinary medicine. Why I need to work with a physician or vice versa? I'm a physician. Why, how I'm going to work with a veterinarian? Uh, I find that the people actually themselves, they really, they really get it. They really get it very quick. But then what happens is that the institutional uh, uh, silos, the institutional structure, our agenda, we are supposed to do this. This is not in our mission. This is not in our mandate. The bureaucracy is when it comes in the world. You will be surprised how many people you find that they would like to collaborate and you have these great ideas, but then when you deal with their respective institutions, of course it becomes complicated. <laughs> I mean, we, we, are a, we are a human, but why, why are we talking about human health? And I see it in some of these examples that I give, but you keep just working, keep working and keep changing the system because the, chist, the systems need to change. I like to tell people, virus, bacteria evolve. When are we going to evolve? <laughs> when is the health system going to evolve? And then I tell them, since, since everyone talks about viruses in the last two years, okay, viruses are evolving. When are we going to change the all approaches, unilateral, one disease, one discipline to solve complex that are clearly multifactorial? And that's the challenge come at the institution level. You find plenty of people, as I, as I guess this colleague is saying, there is a lot of enthusiasm, but it needs to come and, and, and it needs to continue. It's a step day by day, example by example. And it has to change. It cannot continue like this. And I, I think thanks to great work from you and, and all of your colleagues, again, both locally and internationally, that one, one step at a time, hopefully we will we will get there. And, and as we continue to have uh, more, um, learning more of the epidemiology and having more of the scientific support too. Um, so we have one minute left. I'm going to ask a very quick question. There's many questions that we weren't able to get to in the chat pod. I apologize for that. Um, so is there a risk of M. bovis to pets who are fed a, fed a raw meat diet? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, and there are, there are data published on that. I think it's one of the pictures that I have there, it was a cat in the UK with Mycobacterium bovis. And yes, the data is there, it's less common, it's not a big concern because of social cultural factors and the epidemiology of the disease, but absolutely, technically speaking, a cat, a dog, many other animals and pets, they can get infected and affected with M. bovis. Affected, I mean, affected, I mean, clinical disease. Indeed, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you for answering all of our, our questions and again, for sharing your experiences. Um, so we're just about at time. So we're going to wrap up today's PHO microbiology round session. And I would like to, again, say a very big thank you to Dr. Francesco Bolea Popelka for presenting. And I'd also like to thank all of you who joined us for today's session. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO microbiology round survey for our session today. And please try to help this to uh, sorry, please try to complete this to try to help us improve our programming for next year. And lastly, to access past PHO rounds presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education events and click on presentations. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.